Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, my name is Anne and I'm the auditor of the Law Society. Well, very nice to meet you, Anne. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, well, it's great um, anyway to virtually meet you. I'm so sorry, you know, we, we can't obviously see you in person for I know, um, but no, it's great to anyway do this over Zoom. And I think has Ruth sent out your medal? Have you gotten your medal yet? No, I never received. And um, well, I'll be sure to we'll we'll follow up the path anyway and make okay, sure it right. gets out to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think if you're ready anyway, we'll get into the um virtual anyway presentation of okay. the award. Um, then we might move on to just a few questions that we have for you, Ms. Alred. Okay, so for all of our members watching here today, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about the award and why Ms. Alred has been nominated for it and will be receiving it um, today. So the Law Society in Trinity was founded in 1933, just recently enough. <laughs> and for 88 years, the society has strived to provide its members with opportunities to socialize, to engage in discourse um, and societal thought in the process. Um, the award was founded by Mary Robinson, former auditor of the society, and of course, the first female president of Ireland. And um, rarely bestowed, previous recipients of this award include Sir Bob Geldof, Sarah Raftery, um, and Samantha Power, to name a few. Um, this year in particular, the Law Society wants to place an emphasis on empowering students, not only in their careers, but in their everyday lives. And it is for this reason that Miss Gloria Allred has been nominated for the award. Um, voted as one of the best lawyers in the United States, um, Miss Allred is a fearless um, lawyer, feminist, television and radio commentator, activist, um, advocate, um, and of course, um, as, we, as I've read, a female crusader. She has championed women's rights and has devoted her career to fight for civil rights across boundaries of gender, race, age, sexual orientation, and social class. Ms. Alred serves as an inspiration, not only to young female lawyers like myself, but to all. And it is as a result of her astonishing work that she has been inducted into the US, United States Women's National Hall of Fame. So in today's world, with its continuing injustices, we are constantly reminded of the need for trailblazing lawyers, lawyers like Miss Gloria Albert. As such, um, it is an honor to have her, you know, virtually here today and to present her um, with the praises Elite Award. So thank you very much, much, Ms. Aldred. Um, it is an absolute honor. Thank you very much. I, I'm just absolutely thrilled, uh, shocked and surprised uh, to have received your invitation to accept the award. And uh, I'm just inspired by the fact that there are and women uh, in Ireland in the Law Society who care about injustice against women and want to support uh, lawyers such as myself who fight for women's rights. And my law firm, uh, Allred Markham Global, which is located in the offices in Los Angeles and in New York, um, has been the leading law firm for women's rights in the United States for 27 years. Care about injustice for women, uh, care about rights for women, and care about righting the wrongs uh, against women and equalizing the power uh, between uh, women and men and making sure that we always fight for equal rights uh, against gender violence, against sexual abuse, and sexual assault, uh, sexual abuse, uh, economic injustice, uh, violence against women. Thank you very much uh, in honoring me you are willing to statement on your values, which are that women deserve respect and dignity uh, and equal rights, not only in the United States, but all over the world. And I have, and still do, represent many victims from all over the world, victims of wrongs by powerful men. Power, and that's the only one I do. 
No, absolutely. I think you have definitely throughout, you know, your long and exceptional career have um, reciprocated that message that William, Will, William, Will, women do certainly, you know, deserve our respect. Um, and it's something that, you know, I look forward to talking about you perhaps later on. But for um, perhaps Ms. Aldred, the best place to start in, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, your early um, childhood and how you grew up? Yes, well, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my parents owned my elementary education. My mother came to the United States when she was in her 20s, uh, and she uh, came from Manchester, England, uh, where she grew up. Uh, not too far from us. <laughs> yes, not too far. And I have visited uh, relatives over in Manchester, and we have been many decades. <laughs> and I always wanted to go to Ireland, but you know, now with COVID, I have not been able to get there. Hope one day to be able to do so. But uh, not yet. She, not was, yet. she came with little or no money in the pocket in her life. And my father uh, was born in the United States, and my grandmother also immigrated on Ontario from Michigan. Um, apologies, sorry, Ms. Alred, I'm finding it very difficult to hear. Is the oh um, I, I I'm getting a lot of output output noise or okay. all good to go? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Um so I might ask you then again if that's okay, Ms. Alred, um, just because I don't think um we could hear you properly. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your early childhood kind of how you grew up okay um yes i grew up in philadelphia pennsylvania uh and my mother was from manchester england which i know is not far from you yeah. <laughs> and she came to the united states in her 20s uh, looking for a better life and uh my father uh, i think was born in the united states so that's not 100 percent certain and uh, because his mother, my grandmother was born in Europe, uh, we think Poland or white Russia, and uh, she never spoke a word of English. Uh, but in any event, uh, I attended the Philadelphia High School for Girls. I was very fortunate to attend. That was a public uh, high school, all academic, all girls. And we were told that we were going to be the leaders of the future. 
Uh, and at one point, uh, I was feeling not confident about myself. I didn't think I'd be able to compete against the girls who were from all over the city, who were daughters of lawyers and elected officials and were successful business people. And I wanted to drop out. And the counselor said, why do you want to drop out? I said, I'm not as smart as these other girls in my class. And she said, well, who do you think is the smartest girl? And I told her, and she said, oh, I have her file here and I have your file here. And she pulled out our two files from the drawer and she said, your IQ is, is only five points lower than Sandy's IQ, the president of our class. And she said, you belong at Girls High. We're not going to let you leave. And I didn't realize at the time that I could have left because it was a public school. But in any event, I always followed an adult in authority. And she said I couldn't, so I did. It turned out to be a very good decision. Yeah. I realized I think later that's an that she didn't really have two <laughs> files in her door. She just said that to cause me to stay. And I thank her for that uh, because as a result of you know, finishing being graduated from girls high school. I was accepted to the University of Pennsylvania and where I was also graduated and also then from New York University where I earned a master's degree <clears throat> and then into law school at Loyola University School of Law in Los Angeles where I was fortunate enough to meet uh, two of my classmates who I thought would be extraordinary partners uh, if I formed a law firm and they are They listened to me for some reason in a class at graduation from law school uh, out of 300 and some. The other was very high up and they had offers from big firms, but for some reason they listened to me and joined me and we've been practicing law for 47 years together. So that's a little bit of a nutshell of uh, my story. I was a teacher uh, in public schools before I became a lawyer for more than six and a half years in what we call high risk formerly called disadvantaged schools with in, in tough neighborhoods where kids had not received much of a, an education. And um, at, at, in any event, I went on to become a lawyer and uh, I'm, I'm just blessed to be able to do what I do to fight for women and minorities to be afforded equal rights and to get accountability from those who commit wrongs against them. Absolutely. Um, and I just thought it was very interesting when you um, attained, you know, your bachelor's degree in English in, I think it was 1963, you know, you wrote your thesis on, um, you know, black writers. And I think this was very much to the objection of your professors at the time. So um, was civil rights movements, I guess, always something of particular interest to, do, to you? And um, where did this interest arise from? Yes, I, I wanted to uh, write my dissertation, which was for honors in English, on uh, African-American novelists. And that included um, Ralph Ellison and, um, and, and some other famous writers at the time, Malcolm X. Um, and uh, it, it, he said, well, why would you want to do it on African-American writers? And I said, well, because I've never read anything by an African-American writer. <laughs> and here I am receiving honors in English, or I hope to receive it, from an Ivy League college. And I think to complete my education, I, I should read something by an African-American writer. And he said, well, they haven't, they haven't written anything worth reading. And I said, well, Professor Chester, how will I know that unless I read them? And he said, well, you can do that, but you may risk not receiving honors in English. And I said, I'll take the risk. <laughs> uh, and so I did it. I submitted my dissertation um, and others submitted theirs. I didn't hear anything. One of the writers that I read about uh, and that I wrote about was James Baldwin. And um, a few weeks later, after her hearing nothing, James Baldwin was on the cover of Time magazine. And then I received on <laughs> English. So I guess I've yeah. always been a bit of a rebel uh, with the cause. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that I was involved in, you know, 
racial issues. It just was a, an intellectual curiosity I had. And, and, um, and then I did become, you know, want to teach in African-American schools. Um, but, you know, it's just, just something that I felt was Absolutely. important. And by the way, I ended up many years later at, at Ralph Ellison's funeral representing the wife and ultimately the widow and, and leading with his widow a funeral procession because he, of course, you know, was the author of Roots and um, very well respected in, you know, in the United States when he died, not only in the African American community, but, in, you know, the entire world. And so it was just amazing to sit by his mom and know that I had bought uh, to be able to write about him. And, I, and if anything, it was foreseen of what was to come later on in your career. <laughs> And you spoke there, Ms. Allred, how, you know, you were a teacher before you became, you know, embarked on your career as an attorney. I was um, so I guess, a yeah, and what, um, what motivated you to change um, careers or how did that come about? Yeah, I was a teacher. And by the way, I, I was assigned to an African-American high school, all boys, uh, because there was a court case in, in Philadelphia that said teachers who did the best on the test had to be assigned to the toughest schools that called disadvantage. So I was assigned to that school. And um, in any event, uh, I, I wanted to become a teacher because I, frankly, I enjoyed, you know, teaching, but beyond that, it was better hours for me because I was a single parent and had to raise a child. I would have more time with my child than I did when I was an assistant buyer at Gimbal Brothers department store which required long hours. And I had done that before becoming a teacher. But yeah, anyway, yeah. I did that and um, ultimately enjoyed it very much, moved, decided to move to California and sought a teaching job there. And that was after what we call the Watts riots or the Watts rebellion where the neighborhood was burned down partly as an, on, on account of bad conditions in the schools. And I taught there and then became the first female staff person of the teachers union, which was not a union at the time, it was called the Los Angeles Teachers Association, ultimately became a, uh, uh, a union. And I did that and then ultimately uh, earned a degree to be a, uh, or a credential, become a high school principal, secondary supervision. But then they were only wanting high school princi principals who were African-American in African-American schools. So I decided to leave teaching. I didn't get upset by that because I thought that was the right decision for the schools and for the young people in them. And then I decided to go to law school, which I did. So now I'm fighting for minorities and women in different ways. <laughs> so everybody listening should remember one door can close in your life, but another can open. Absolutely. I think that's such an important message. And even, you know, earlier on when you spoke of how initially earlier on in school, you didn't at times felt confident enough or as um, smart enough as your other peers. But I think that self-belief and, um, you know, resilience of, you know, adapting to new careers is so important and which you have clearly done so well. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> um, so you um, you attended um, Loyola um, University School of Law, so I don't know if I pronounced that right, and were admitted to the State Bar of California in 1975. Um, so how was, you know, how was life as a young female attorney in the United States? Well, when I became an attorney, there were not many women in the legal profession. That's for sure. Men. <laughs> To give you an example, in my law school class, I think 93% were men and 7% were women. Um, but um, when I began, I decided, you know, I'm blessed and privileged to be able to become a lawyer because most women at the time would never have become a lawyer. So I decided I wanted to volunteer some time and take some cases involving women's rights. So I joined the National Organization for Women and um, and National Women's Political Caucus. There I met some, um, you know, other feminists 
feminist, just a person who believes in legal, social, political, and economic equality for women with men. And uh, it was a small group, uh, but there were some judges and women judges and women lawyers. Well, there were some women lawyers, but not necessarily in the area of women's rights. And um, anyway, they asked me to do a press conference. I didn't know anything about press conference. I, nobody knew me. I thought, why would anybody listen to me? They said, the judges said, do you want to do something for women's rights? I said, yes. They said, well, just show up at a certain time, a certain place will tell you what to say. <laughs> and we did. I did. And, and so it, that was to advocate for more women judges that the governor, Governor Brown, had promised if he were elected to uh, appoint more women judges. And he had failed to appoint them. So I gave my first press conference criticizing him for not appointing <laughs> you know, women judges. And as a result, he appointed more women judges. And then they said, oh, it was successful. You need to do it again, Gloria. So I did it again, uh, maybe a month later, three weeks later. And then he appointed more women judges. And ultimately, he said, I saw him and he said, Gloria, why do you always criticize me for not appointing enough women judges? And he named a few he had appointed. I said, Governor, you can't name all the male judges that you've appointed when you can't name all the female judges you've appointed. That's when you will have appointed enough. That's yeah. when <laughs> I was criticizing you. So in any event, that's how I got started off. I was also asked to become president of the National Organization for Women the Los Angeles chapter. And I did. And so then I started seeing more and more, you know, women with problems and understanding that whatever happened to me in my life was just not, not just bad luck. There is so much discrimination and also violence against women, economic injustice. And although I took a few cases to begin, I decided I had to take more and more and more because almost nobody else was doing it. And I felt that I had a duty to do it. And I asked my partners to take some cases and they did it. And then ultimately they said, this is a very interesting area of women's rights. They were not movement people, but they just thought it was wrong what was happening to women. And they started doing it and continued. And I never thought that 47 years later, there still would be such a need to represent women who have been victims of injustice. Absolutely. And um, I know in your documentary, Seeing Alred, you said, you spoke how, you know, there is a war on women. So I guess, do you believe this is a battle we can win? Yes, I do believe there's a war on women. Thank you for mentioning the documentary, which can still be seen because it's still streaming on Netflix. Uh, called <laughs> I, I, would, I would highly like, recommend this. <laughs> like a like through glasses, seeing all red. And um, in any event, uh, I do believe there's still a war on women. And actually, uh, one of the producers of my documentary said, I didn't know what you meant when you said that, but now I see what you meant. <laughs> and a very significant example of the war on women is the uh, constant efforts to restrict and eliminate a woman's right, a constitutional right to choose abortion, um, at least at certain stages of her pregnancy. Absolutely. Your famous case, Roe v. Wade. Well, the leading case, Roe v. Wade, and uh, in the United States, um, I didn't argue that case before the Supreme Court, but I did represent uh, Jane Roe, Roe of Roe v. Wade, in her efforts to have a voice and to speak out, which we did for quite a while. And the point is this. I had uh, an abortion when it was a crime to do so in the United States, not for a woman to have an abortion, it was not a crime for her, but it was a crime for anyone who performed the abortion on her. And that meant that women had to go and seek back alley abortions, meaning not with a licensed healthcare provider like a doctor or a nurse, but for someone who just would do it for the money. And I almost died from an abortion legal abortion. And so that has strengthened my commitment to ensure that abortion remains safe, legal, affordable, and available in the United States. It's a key issue even today. Absolutely. In just a few weeks, a, a major case will be argued before the United 
United States Supreme Court. There are those who want to eliminate abortion. Abortion will never be eliminated. It's just that it will be, you know, go underground. And we always say that more women were maimed or died from illegal abortions that men than men ever were killed in the Vietnam War. So we we want abortion to be safe and legal. Um, and because when it's not, the women who are most hurt are young women, women of color. Rural women and poor women. Poor women. And or women go to another state. And so we must make sure that they are protected. And in Texas, right now, where they passed a law to uh, essentially say that anyone who assists a woman to have an abortion after she's six weeks pregnant um, can sue, can be sued by a stranger. In other words, if a mother of a daughter who's having an abortion, or the husband of that young woman who wants an abortion, or the best friend, uh, or sister, anyone, sister, they could be sued for $10,000 by a stranger for assisting her. That certainly, and an abortion clinic could be sued. That's an extremely high bar. So it has a chilling effect and we have to stop this. It's, it's just being done by politicians hoping to appeal to constituencies and, and get their own political career enhanced or get them reelected. And it's just terrible to subject, you know, women to this outrage of laws that restrict and eliminate their rights. So would you say that the legalization of, um, or if anything, the illegalization of abortion is becoming more and more prominent in the United States? Like is Roe v. Wade under threat? Yes, 100%. Uh, it's, uh, and that is why this Mississippi case that will be uh, argued in just a few weeks before the US Supreme Court is so important. The, I call them the anti-choice uh, mandatory motherhood uh, group that seeks to outlaw abortions, uh, restrict them, uh, is, has been trying since 1973 when the United States Supreme Court decided Roe v. Wade and decided that a woman has a constitutional right to choose abortion at certain stages of the pregnancy. They have continued to try to, you know, these anti-choice people, what I call the fetal supremacy people uh, that thinks the fetus should have more rights than an adult woman, um, they have never stopped trying to restrict abortion uh, rights. So um, yes, this is extremely important, high stakes right now. And uh, especially because the former President Trump appointed uh, to the United States Supreme Court uh, some appointees who are clearly anti-choice and we just don't know what the future holds. Absolutely. Um, well, I hope anyway, we won't see a day where abortion is illegalized all throughout the United States, because I'm sure- Right, and let me just say, when you say hope, we, we all hope for that too. But we always say we have to fight for our rights. No one has ever given women any rights anywhere in the world. In the UK, in Ireland, the United States, anywhere in the world, to this day, no one ever gave us rights. We've always had to fight to win our rights. And if everyone listening can remember only one thing I say today, remember that. No one will give you anything. You must stand up and fight for it. And that's how. We have won our rights and we have to continue to fight to preserve our rights and to win new rights because our, that's what our daughters deserve. That's what all of you listening deserve. You know, uh, the members I hope the members listening as part of the Law Society, I hope their message, it doesn't go on um, deaf ears. I don't think there's plenty of people who love fighting for rights, I know, amongst <laughs> my Well, team. you know, yes, and fighting for us, but we have to do our part in our own way. We also Absolutely. have to choose our battles very carefully. Uh, we can't fight every battle, but we can one fight the ones we care about most and that we think it's time to stand up and do. And don't let fear be the weapon that is used against you measure the benefits versus the risk of every battle you decide to fight and you will decide which ones are right for you and seek support from others as well. 
And what would you say, Miss Arid, are the most important battles that women's um, that women face in America, or perhaps even like in the world, you know, in general? I would say, uh, in addition to the battle for reproductive mm -hmm. rights and access to contraception and abortion, mm -hmm. um, we also have to fight for against sexual harassment in employment, because sexual harassment is a barrier to the enjoyment of equal employment opportunity. It puts women in a no-win situation. I mean, you can just, you know, ex excel uh, at Trinity College. You can excel in law society and your legal careers. No one is spared from this, okay? And it places you in a no-win situation. If you're in business, for example, and your boss sexually harasses you, in words or in deeds or in both. He is placing you or she is placing you, mainly it's he, uh, in a no-win situation. If you say yes to his sexual advances, then he may get tired of you after a while and then you lose your job. If you say no, he may go into ego shock and then you may lose your job or be retaliated against um, in some way in your employment. So. You may have so many degrees from university and none of that is going to help if you are sexually harassed. So it's, it's always important to get legal advice if you are in that situation before you decide what to do and get support. In the United States, it's illegal to retaliate against someone who protests sexual harassment. But that is a major barrier that women face, women of all ages. and. Um, no one is going to be spared from that ultimately. And um, so that's one thing that's important. I would say other battles that are extremely important is child sexual abuse. It's so many victims of child sexual abuse. We handle many cases of adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So we are, for example, expanding statute of limitations in many states. Statutes of limitations are arbitrary time periods during which a person must assert their rights, either criminally or in a civil case, lawsuit. And if it's not done within a certain period of time, it's too late. And even if it's a meritorious claim, it's too late to assert it. So we are going to legislators, and you see that in my documentary, uh, Seeing All Red how we go with victims to legislatures in many states and testify and explain why it's important to expand the time period, lengthen it or eliminate it so that victims who become survivors, who then become fighters for change uh, can uh, assert their rights by filing a lawsuit against the wrongdoer, against the perpetrator of sexual abuse. It also allows us to help women with confidential settlements, because if it's settled without a lawsuit and confidentially, then there will be no need for a lawsuit. But we can only do that if they're within the time period generally to assert their rights. Um, although, as we explained to wrongdoers, it's never too late to do the right thing. So even if that time period for asserting rights has passed, the, t the wrongdoer can still do the right thing and compensate the victim, compensating them, literally making them pay the consequences of their wrong is a teaching moment for the wrongdoers. And I always say, who should bear the cost of the wrong? It should be the wrongdoer, not the victim. Those are some examples of how far we have to go. And of course, uh, we still have to fight for women to receive not only equal pay, but the title and the responsibility of the job they're doing. And I have a case today, I won't mention the name because it's confidential, but there a woman who's a very talented person was asked to work for free for certain periods of time during her job. No woman should be asked to work for no pay. Everybody's mm -hmm. gotta be compensated, <laughs> sexually harassed, and promised higher positions, which she never got if she would essentially have sex with her boss. Um, she would, she tried to finesse it, not make him angry. But then when she said no, ultimately he retaliated against her. So 
now we have, you know, a claim and possibly a lawsuit if it doesn't settle. So these are the kinds of things still in 2021 women are facing, all right? And, but there is good, that's a bad news. Good news is there's something the women can do about it. Seek legal advice, and then you will know your options that can make an informed decision. Absolutely. So, you know, on the kind of note of, you know, sexual harassment, it's something, again, you speak about in your documentary that the powerful, you know, men where there's a power dynamic have to understand that there are rules, you know, there are boundaries um, and they must respect those boundaries. So I guess, do you believe in recent times with, you know, Me Too and various other feminist movements um, and where coverage of sexual uh, assault, like uh, allegations in the media has become more prevalent. Do you believe there has been a cultural shift um, or? Well, I, I, I do believe uh, that we've been doing in our law firm, the Me Too movement for 47 years. Now there's a hashtag. That's a good thing. <laughs> and more women are coming out and saying, me too, I'm also a victim of. But of course, that's always dangerous too, mm -hmm. because they can be sued because rich and powerful men have lawyers that they can sue them for saying, we didn't commit that a crime. You're accusing us of a crime, rape and so forth. It's a crime. So uh, they have to be very careful, strategic in what they say. But yes, I think there's a shift in that many men now who are the wrongdoers, are living in fear of the victims coming forward. And before, you know, women live in fear of what would happen if they spoke out or sued the wrong doer. They asked themselves, would we be believed? No one would believe us. Now they're saying they are being believed by juries. You know, I represented the key victim in the Harvey Weinstein criminal case in New York, Mimi, uh, Mimi excuse me. And uh, she was very brave to testify. And the jury found that Harvey Weinstein was guilty of criminal sexual assault. And he was sentenced to 20 years uh, in prison as a result. And yes, many celebrities came out, A-list celebrities and said, yes, he did that to me too. But, you know, it was Mimi, who was not a celebrity, who had the courage to testify. And he was convicted as a result. Uh, so not everyone who comes out has the courage testify, which requires being subjected to intense cross-examination and a lot of personal sacrifice. So I really admire her uh, for what she did. And um, I had two other clients in the case as well, whom I also admire. And now Harvey Weinstein will also be prosecuted in Los Angeles coming up next year, early next year. And I represent two very brave uh, persons who allege they were victims of his in that criminal case as well. We also had a civil case against Harvey Weinstein. So yes, district attorneys, prosecutors are now prosecuting more cases than they would have ever prosecuted in the past for victims of sexual assault uh, and sexual harassment. Uh, and that's a good thing. And juries are believing women. But of course, sometimes, you know, it's not just a woman's word uh, accusing the man and the man's word saying he didn't do it. There are, we have now what's called Me Too witnesses where other women allege a similar, uh, a similar pattern of conduct uh, by the uh, uh, accused. And that has also helped uh, to win convictions. So um, yes, it's exciting to see the empowerment of women, young women, older women, women of different races, ethnic origins, you know, being brave and, you know, they contact me and they say, how can I help? And um, often at no benefit to themselves, except they feel good about helping win justice, which is good. And sometimes a benefit to themselves if we can help them assert their rights and vindicate their rights as well. Absolutely. And you know, you spoke there how, you know, the, the process of the trial and it can be very um, difficult for women to go through. Do you believe, you know, we need um, any reformation in the trial process, perhaps, or safeguards put in place to make, um, you know, the terrible cross-examination or um, just to encourage, I suppose, more women to step forward? Do you believe any reforms need to be made? I think it's important that women, for example, be, have access to private attorneys to advise them and support them mm -hmm. if they are testifying in a high-profile criminal case. Uh, because as a private attorney, for example, I can uh, speak confidentially to my client. 
a prosecutor doesn't speak confidentially to a victim witness or a witness in a case. Uh, there's no confidentiality because the victim is not their client. The victim, the prosecutor is bringing the case on behalf of the people of the state or the people of the United States. Um, and that is, does, they don't enjoy confidentiality. So it's important for them to be able to speak freely to a private attorney and know it'll be kept confidential and get advised about perhaps how to, what to expect in a court. Uh, you know, what are their rights as, and what are their responsibilities as a victim? I've also just represented victims for whom charges were filed against R. Kelly, the famous singer, songwriter. And of course he was convicted. Um, and I've also represented, you know, persons who alleged that they were victims, Bill Cosby. We have a civil case against him coming up in the spring. Uh, and um, I represent uh, a, a Me Too witness uh, in the trial coming up against Cooper Gooding Jr. Uh, uh, also in the spring. So yes, we have a role to play. We do mainly civil cases, but we also have a role to play in criminal cases. And, you know, most women cannot afford attorneys. So I think it's really important that private attorneys also do this pro bono, meaning for the public good and without payment, less laws can be changed in which private attorneys, you know, could be compensated. But um, in any event, uh, this is, uh, you know, it, I think if they have support, victims are going to be able to do it. How can we change laws? Statute of limitations is one way. Um, and um, I think that's extremely important. For example, in New York right now, uh, there's an effort to change laws so that there is a longer statute of limitations for adult survivors of adult sexual abuse, not just longer period of time for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. So, you know, women lawyers are, are also very active in that effort uh, to change the law so that essentially the courtroom door is not, not shut in the face of victims. It's, it's open so that they can get their day in court as well. Absolutely. So, you know, Miss um, already clearly have taken on, you know, those names there, uh, numerous numbers of very high profile cases. And um, I think you were what the New Republic said you were, you know, a longtime master of the press conference. So how does the publicity of a trial affect the administration of justice? Um, and let me just say something about uh, the press conference. Women are entitled to have a voice. Women should not have to live in silence with the wrong, about the wrongs against them. Again, having a press conference only, a, with only involves a small number of our cases. I'll say 99% of our cases are handled confidentially in our law firm. And, you know, we have to decide if it will help rather than hurt. And if the, the, the strategy and the goal of the client, and sometimes it is not the right thing to do uh, for many reasons, so we don't do it. And that's most cases. But in some cases, if the client feels that that's the right thing for that client, then if it'll help to accomplish a goal in case we will. Uh, the second part of your question was what, Anne? Um, it was how does publicity or I guess the media attention, how does that affect the, like, the um, running of a trial or the administration of justice, if it affects it at all? Well, you know, some cases are televised, some cases are not. Um, for example, in the Harvey Weinstein case, that was not, the judge did not allow that case to be televised. Um, in the case against OJ Simpson, uh, where he was charged with killing Nicole Brown Simpson and may she rest in peace, um, his ex-wife, the mother of the children, and uh, another victim, Ronald Goldman, that case was televised. That was in the 90s. Um, so, you know, it, in federal court, uh, the United States courts, cases are not allowed to be televised. Um, so for some which cases which are, for example, there's a case right now, it's in the jury's hands in the United States. Uh, it, it was televised, the opening and the closing arguments were there this morning on television. And that was uh, the Aubrey uh, case where he uh, was killed by an African-American young man who was out jogging in Georgia, was killed by three white men. Um, 
So that, you know, the final arguments were televised this morning. I, I think the courts are paid for by taxpayers and that cases should be televised if they are, you know, have important issues of public interest, uh, but not all judges agree. And so we'll have to see what happens in the future. Uh, that, no, definitely. And I think, you know, COVID-19 um, definitely affects as well or promotes the televisation of trials. And as we see now, everything going online and being able to be viewed by a much wider audience than traditionally would have been. Um, is there any time in particular, or case in particular, um, where you find it difficult to deal with the media scrutiny of, you know, your high profile cases? No. Because I'm ready for that battle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, it's important, uh, again, uh, it's for women to have a voice. I know it's very disturbing to some people who are powerful and have committed injustices against women. They're used to having it all one-sided and having their highly paid PR flax uh, and lawyers be able to create their narrative, and stick to their narrative without having you know, a woman lawyer like myself pop up and, uh, you know, attack their narrative uh, being false or misleading or not, you know, just not accurate. So uh, that's upsetting to them, especially <laughs> if I'm involved uh, in speaking out on a criminal case. Uh, and we've, I've had my confrontations with women defense lawyers and, um, and then, uh, you know, with, with others, and that's fine. Uh, I think we all have a role in the marketplace of ideas in the court of public opinion, uh, as well as inside the court. But uh, in certain cases, uh, we can't speak out. Now, for example, uh, in the case of um, Jeffrey Epstein, we could, because he was deceased. Uh, that's a whole other story for another time. I remember <laughs> 20 victims of Jeffrey Epstein. In the case of Ms. Maxwell, uh, which is going to be starting trial shortly, uh, Jolene Maxwell, I've decided I'm not gonna speak out because there is a rule in federal court that if you're closely associated with case or a federal court where this case is being tried in New York, that if you're closely associated with the case, shouldn't speak out because the court doesn't wanna have the jury influenced. Um, but in any event, I do have, I've represented some victims who certainly were aware of and had contact with Ms. Maxwell, uh, you know, during the time that she was with Jeffrey Epstein. Um, and so uh, they're not going to be witnesses at this trial, um, reasons I can't disclose, but I, I just don't feel comfortable in speaking about Ms. Maxwell, at least at this point. Uh, and not until the trial is concluded. So, you know, we have to make judgments as we go. Um, but um, in general, I do think it's important to keep speaking out for women's rights. Um, famous labor organizer, uh, Mother Jones and feminist once said, uh, I'm not a humanitarian, I'm a hell raiser. And I think <laughs> that also applies to me to some extent. And I you know, agree. <laughs> because if not, you know, if 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 women, if the if if the world is not aware of the wrongs against women, they will not feel any need to pass rights for women. They have to know what's wrong. They have to hear from the victims of the wrong too. And sometimes that's just in a court of law, not on the internet. Sometimes, uh, you know. In confidential settlement, they could still go to the police. They're still allowed to go to the police and have a criminal case uh, if, if the district attorney is willing to file one. So again, that's how we get the world aware of why we need rights for women because of many wrongs against them. Absolutely. And, um, you know, there's a reason why, I suppose, you've become known as one of America's most effective um, you know, advocates of family and um, feminist causes, you know, Ms. Allred, you certainly inspired myself. And I think I can speak on behalf of our members. And um, when I say, you know, you've definitely imparted many, many words of wisdom. And I suppose to be an advocate and to, you know, to stand up and to fight, I guess, 
be proactive um, mm -hmm. for women's rights and you know civil rights um, as a whole um, I suppose. <laughs> so, all, thank you I'm also very you know inspired by the fact that Mary Robinson created this award okay yeah. <laughs> so you're so far ahead of us in Ireland in that way that you had a woman prime minister and we still have that not yet had uh, won a, uh, a woman president in the United States, which is an absolute disgrace because we always say uh, a woman's place is in the house, the White House. Uh, and uh, we almost made it with uh, Hillary Clinton, who I supported, but uh, for many reasons, even though she won more votes than uh, Trump, she was not elected. So that's a subject for another time. <laughs> but we still have to fight to a woman in the White House. <laughs> and um, we have a woman vice president whom I know and I admire, uh, Kamala Harris, but we still have not yet won a woman's place uh, behind the desk in the Oval Office in the White House. So we have a long way to go. I suppose, Miss I'm already my last question then on that note to you would be, will we be seeing you maybe one day in the White House behind the um, Oval Office desk? Uh, no, uh, you will not, but thank you for that. Uh, uh, no, I, I, I know my place. My place is, is a strong advocate for women to empower them, to inform them, to want them to get in and right those wrongs. And, you know, sacrifice is necessary because that's the way we uh, must do it in order to win our rights. But that is not my role, but I support others who wish to do that. We need more women in every, every level of business, every level, you know, in the political world, in the sports world, the entertainment world, religious world, every world, in every world, we need more women coming up and let's support them and do that. And I always say, I like to, to also quote the other thing by, uh, Mother Jones, which is pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Ms. Allred. Um, so now we have three questions from our guests watching. Would you mind? Um, if no, I'd love to. Please yeah? go ahead. Okay, perfect. So from Miss Rothwell, um, we have, is there a particular cause that you represented that was important to you and why? Uh, I would say every case is important to me. My last case, my present case, my next case, if it's important to my clients, it's important to me. So all of them, all of what we do is important. I can't say one is more important than the other because I'm guided by what's important to my client. Absolutely, I think, I think that's a very you know, excellent answer and it just shows how passionate about you are about all types of your work. Um, so you have another question from Miss Orla Hughes and she says, hi, Gloria, thank you for such an interesting webinar. I was wondering whether you had any role models that helped shape your life and career. Uh, well, uh, I had uh, my role model was uh, kind of a great aunt of mine, Rachel Ash, who was, I think, the first woman heart doctor uh, at a children's hospital in Philadelphia. And at the time when I was growing up, she's the only woman I knew that uh, was a professional woman and cardiologist. And she's the only woman I knew who didn't cook and didn't care. <laughs> and so she, you know, she inspired me and supported me uh, in having a career. And of course, also Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the United States Supreme Court, who is a hero to so many women uh, and I had, if you look at my uh, homepage on gloriaallred.com, and by the way, anybody who, who does see it will see a photograph of former and now deceased uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and where she and I were chatting at the U.S. Supreme Court, and someone took a photo, and we also have other photos, and I was honored to be able to have dinner with her, and you know. I, I have, everybody knows I love her. I've got little statues of her around my house. Uh, because I have her said, focus here beside me. <laughs> yeah, so for example, when people, somebody asked her how many women should be on the United States Supreme Court, there are nine justices. And she said nine. And the person was shocked 
and she said, well, nobody is shocked when, when there have been for most decades, nine men justices on the United States Supreme Court. Why should they be shocked when <laughs> she suggests that the nine justices should all be women? But uh, so it's something, she always had thought provoking statements. She made wonderful arguments before the Supreme Court when she was uh, a lawyer advocating for women's rights and then as a justice. So she was very courageous, well ahead of her time, outspoken to the very end. And uh, I just loved her courage. And um, so she was, was and remains a role model even now that she's deceased. Absolutely. Um, and we have another question from Miss Anthony Hamilton. He says, Miss Ian Allred, what do you believe residents of Texas, Texas can do to protect the decision by Gov Abbott, if there are any ways? Well, protest is actually a very important word. Um, we had in Los Angeles, for example, a not long ago in October, a protest march, this march. Uh, I was a featured speaker at City Hall uh, in LA and also in Beverly Hills that day. And, then, and I invited a, a young woman to speak with me, Paxton Smith, 18 year old high school valedictorian uh, this year who uh, tore up her approved speech by the administrators and at the graduation gave the speech she really wanted to give, which was in support of the right to choose and against the Texas law, uh, which uh, uh, would restrict a woman's right to choose abortion. So she uh, and I then spoke at the Women's March and, um, and we are actually gonna have a book uh, that's out uh, in, on January 22nd, uh, 2022 uh, the war on women's bodies. And that is going to have chapters about choice and why it's so important that we protect the right to choose. And uh, Paxton and I will be together on that anniversary of Roe v. Wade, January 22nd uh, for the book launch. And um, so I, I did that because I'm 80 years old, Dan. <laughs> well, I, 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 you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think it for a minute anyway. I, I always say fighting injustice is very good for the health, good for my health. I get up every day and I say, what? And then I want to keep fighting uh, women and minorities. So we will be together on that anniversary of Roe v. Wade and everyone should protest all over the world when uh, the right to choose abortion and the access to birth control, when those are restricted, we have to do again what Mother Jones said, don't agonize, organize. And we have to organize and speak out, whether we're speaking out on the internet, in person, both ways, we can all make a difference now. And we all must make a difference. And it takes courage, women in Afghanistan speaking out, that's real courage and women all over the world. So um, that's what we need to do uh, because literally it's a life and death issue that we could die and we have you know, our daughters, our sisters, our mothers, our aunts, many have never said that they've had an abortion. They've never told that secret. And many have died from illegal abortion. So we have to, yes, we have to protest every way that we can. Absolutely. On our rights. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Ms. Allred, you know, um, the past hour, you have certainly inspired, um, you've intrigued everyone with all your stories. And I am, um, I know now I, I, <laughs> I um, feel, um, you know, the message I think to be proactive be a doer and to go and fight <laughs> exactly right and may I just say it's all about justice exactly justice for women and there will never be another season of silence until women have the same rights as men on this green earth thank you so much for inviting me today <laughs> thank you very you much fight. yeah <laughs> thank you very much Ms. Allard and have a good day I suppose with, with, with your your behind us and um, time wise so your day is you know in the middle of it so have a good day and um hopefully you know um I look forward I, for anyone who hasn't seen your documentary seeing Allred I couldn't recommend it highly enough to give it a watch and of course your book as well so um thank you very much thank you so much keep up the fight you are the leaders of the future <laughs> and I am counting on you to assert Vindicate women's rights, and by the way, the rights of gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, and racial minorities as well. All of them, very, very important. Stand up and make sure they're treated with respect and dignity as well. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.
Bye. Bye-bye.